so uh, you have the website, you have the APIs, you might have APIs, nowadays you have one, those. Right? And you have your internal systems. Generally they come from many vendors, right? Then you talk with other organizations. For example, if you flew here from US or outside of Europe, and when you book the flight, most likely you will have you will flew through two airlines. Now the old way of it is that sorry, my airline A says my job is to take you from A to B. Your problem to go from B to C. Now if they don't talk to each other, what does that mean? That means you take your luggage, you check in, all the magic, right? So now this is where these problems start, right? Of course the, the early organizations and earlier systems, they can live on their silos, right? And they didn't really have to talk to each other. Now they start to get these use cases. The initially when the customer come and say that, uh, I want to fly to, from US to uh, some small city in Europe, let say, uh, we don't go there. Please figure out some how to go and you figure out that. You can do it for some time, but now what happened is one, some other organizer, your competitor, figure that, oh, this is very painful for people. I'll let you do it. That forces you to do it also. Right? So this is how the, this story starts. Now what happened is people figure out, okay, I want to talk. I, now, my organization has different, different systems. I want them to talk to each other. Okay, maybe I, I'll say I'll just go for IBM for everything. That, that solves that problem. But you can lose for some time, but now the problem is that now I want to go out. I want to talk to others. It's not a choice. Right? So people want to, to talk, the organization wanted to talk to each other. Now what first happened was that the technology provider said that, by the way, the way it will work is that we are going to take over the work. So there's no problem because it's our proprietary protocol, but we are, since we are going to take over the world, uh, no problem, don't worry. Right? Now, of course you can tell this for one year, two year, three year, five years. Now, remember, your customers are very powerful organizations, <coughs> such as banks, such as governments, etc. Now, they say, please see, I want our customers to Customer asks for this. We want this. Our system need to talk with that other system, other airline. And you say, oh, don't worry, we'll take over the world. Then you say, oh, you have been telling this for last five years, last ten years. Forget it. You are not going to take over the world. Give us a solution. If you don't, we have a lot of programs. Maybe we can do it from the scratch. Right? So now these organizations say, okay, there's okay. We don't have a choice. You had to make it work, right? They, then comes scope, second trial. So, actually, if you haven't read, there's a very interesting article called "Rise and Fall of Coba." It's 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 a it's a very nice one. In my opinion, it's a worth reading by anybody who works in distributed systems. To me, Coba is very interesting because, in my opinion, technically at this point they came to the correct solution. Right? However, it was so complicated to use. The APIs were, were a nightmare. It's very hard to use. And it didn't work out. Right? So they now if you look at the web services, everything that's in here are there. There's a interface descriptions like WSDL. There are common protocols. The way to now the way to work is you need to agree on the network where the two systems can talk to each other when they are completely in different OSs, different program languages, etc. Luckily, we have TCP, which everybody agrees, right? The way to work is that you come into the network and you agree what's going on the network. COBA had that. <coughs> it was a binary protocol. Unfortunately, it was so complicated and the APIs were very bad. It didn't work out. Then the third try, the web services. What they said was the same thing. Of course, the two things, they renamed 
the WSDL in terms of IDL, right? And they, the, I think what they did that really worked was that they said, we'll use XML to agree. On the network format, we'll use XML. It, at that point, really helped because the people can see the XML with their eyes. Right? So I send a request to that guy, he doesn't, he send me a wrong response. I can look at the thing, I can take his WSDL and sometimes I can even generate code to send it. Or I can look on the eye at the board and see, okay, it is wrong here, so we'll fix it. Maybe you talk to the that side. Now, interestingly what happens was the Web series worked for two reasons. One reason was that the, all the big companies agreed on this. Right? They, at this point, they said, we have to make it work. Let's go for XML. And it, uh, they agreed. They created standards. The second thing was it was simple. It was very, very simple. That's what where we are. Right? But now, okay, the, the, the fourth stage, we, I mean, we use this technology a lot. Right? When the now thing in the XML is so verbose, it's slow. It is slow. I mean, <laughs> no, it, it's, I mean, this is a relative statement, right? We, uh, we, uh, I mean, I have worked with code which let you do 10,000 TPS on XML server. Fine, but on the same, if you do binary, it will do 100,000. Right? So, when it is performance sensitive, even we now do binary protocols at there, which includes Thrift, Protocol Buff, Google Protocol Buff, Auro, etc. Now, now people only do it on these sensitive things because the general, most people understand this one, but not this one. But what this says is this was the correct solution, technologically. Right? But the problem was that it, the, this, at this point of time, maybe it was too early, maybe it was too complicated. Right? So, the one, the one lesson, I mean, I, the, uh, so, sorry. I came into this world after Boba, at the time of web series, but I see what's happening here, right? So, one of the main lessons I took away is that if you want a technology to be successful, not successful means not 10 people use it. If you want 10,000 people to use it, it has to be very, very simple. The reason being that the people who, the technology will be successful, you need normal programmers. By the way, not the guys with the PhDs, right? The normal programmers, you can buy, you, sorry, you can rather hire in mass numbers, right? To be able to see and understand and use, right? And also the UX, the US doesn't mean UI, the API, the program interface, etc. Their quality will decide the technology. Fit. Okay, so then there are, okay, so there are many tools for doing this interoperability part. Uh, there are two models. One model is that you start with some programming language, you go and uh, you write some code, Java code, and annotate, and say please create a website out of this. The tools will be do it. Or you are a more somebody who understands this in deep, you go and create the contract first, right? And say, please generate code. And then you can deploy, you fill in the business. Plan. Now there are many tools that does that, right? So these, uh, these two are the projects I worked on, right? And then later came JAXWS, right? This for Java specifically, weekly, which make things much more simple. We are now more and more moving away from web services, right? Into, it's not fully clear, correct to say we are moving into REST, but we are moving into HTTP services from, uh, and JSON HTTP services from XML web services, right? So, and at this point, like when this was really hot, the we we want head to head, but at that at current point, the CX, CXF, Apache CXF, is the main 
soap painting that's been used by men. The reason being that we were so XML friendly versus this Apache CXF was very Java friendly. It's very, very centric on Java. And Java being the main program language on this world, right, they, they won on that point, right? Things you see later. I mean, I, I don't think we even we could have done it differently because we came from very XML centric world, right? So, but uh, these things happen. Okay, fine, right? We figured out the interoperability. The next step is how would you build a system putting these together, right? So there are two, two technologies, two, uh, two proposals to do this. One was service-oriented architecture, other was resource-oriented architecture. I'm sure you have heard at least part of this. This was a major war, right? And <laughs> if you go and read, right, you will find like very complicated arguments over both sides, right? Now, let me start with where they agree, and right? then tell where they don't agree. They agree that the way to build a system, a distributed system, you can't help it, it's a distributed system, is that you build it out of units. The units are services. I'm using the word service in the sense that this is some, this is some work that's available over the network that I can do a call and get a response, right? You build it out of units, which are loosely coupled. That means, ideally, when you change this one, it doesn't break up, right? And then the rest of the architecture, you recompose those units to build your store, build your system. Okay, that's what they agreed to. The what they didn't agree on was that to get take this functionality and first write them as verbs and then put the box that's name after a noun or put them into uh, boxes of nouns and call them called get, pause, delete, and put. Right? Such a simple thing to disagree on. However, <laughs> this was a major fight over many, many years. Right? Uh, of course, again, if you talk to me, I'm also biased. I come from certain world, right? So don't trust everything I say on this. But, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, but eventually, after a lot of fights, disagreements, etc. We kind of agree that you would use whatever the model, what is natural for you in use case. Right? Because there are some use cases which are very natural to do on this model, versus there are some others which are very natural to do on this model. Right? The, you should generally pick the one that's natural. But I mean, if you are sold out to one, you can build anything on that one, which is fine, and which is fine, and uh, like, and it is, it is like religion, and there's no point, like, uh, after a certain point, there's no point uh, arguing about that, right? Um, so, okay. okay, now fine, we have our systems, they can talk to each other, great. We have a way to build a complicated system, recomposing them together. Great. Uh, everything is good, but it does not solve all the problems. <laughs> we can we can talk to each other. <laughs> this other, unfortunately, right? Uh, because now, if you look within the organization, your HR system may be from one vendor, your payroll system from one vendor. They might use web services, but they might use different formats. Their services and at the XML level, it won't be the same. And it's, it's, it gets worse when you cross organizations, etc. And of course, then there are different protocols, different security. So there, there's another layer of incompatibility. Right? So, uh, the answer was that you put something in the middle that will translate between, right? such a very simple concept. And so the integration, idea of integration is the mediation. Right? You sit in the middle and basically 
to that guy you would say, oh, it's on that format versus, so this file you say it's on that format, right? Fine, great, right? So uh, if you want to understand this in details, this this is the great book, right? Mm -hmm. The enterprise integration patterns, which goes through and discuss different of these integration patterns, right? So, okay, fine. Then, now of course, again, you can do this and add code, right? You can write your own, like you can write your own code to do this. But they figure that rather than doing that, because the, now the problem is that when you do it, you would end up putting this translation code, code everywhere, right? And they change, you have to maintain it, etc. So they said, they said that, the way to do it is bring them into one place. They call that ESP, Enterprise Service Pass. Right? They said bring that all code into one place. Right? And they say avoid the spaghetti architecture. Spaghetti architecture means everything randomly talk to somebody else. Instead of that, everybody connect to a bus. The bus understand left hand and right hand side of the world. Right? It do the translation. Right? Then your all your integration code would live in there. Now what you actually practically did was you you take, now you bring in your ESP, you have your services, RESTful or otherwise, and you create a proxy for that service in the ESP, then you write the translation logic in a, some kind of a DSL, some kind of a high level language. Right? Also you might do and some things like security termination because like for example if you have a very complicated security model you don't want the guy who write the service code to have to worry about that you basically say the ESP will terminate the security the within the after the ESP you are in a trusted domain right and so the security is terminated at the ESP and after that the whoever writes the service don't have to worry about kind of okay So, and then uh, there are several uh, ESP players, right? And this was a major market, right? And uh, this was one of the market the WSO2 was very successful in, and, and that's how we grew. Okay? Now, of course, now, up to so far, we were talking about normal service calls. The service calls where I do a invocation, and I'm wait, I, I stand here and wait for a response, right? Now, the normal world doesn't work that way, right? Now, the normal world is asynchronous, right? When you submit a paper for review, you don't sit down and just keep clicking until you see the, what happened, right? Hopefully you don't, right? Because the normal world is asynchronous. I do stuff, I let it go, and I'll do other stuff. Then somehow, some point, I get a notification, or I see, okay, what happened to my paper, right? So, the, so therefore, the, the, these communications happen in these systems, there are other dimensions, right? It could be synchronous versus asynchronous. They might have messages which are one way, or request response. If you read actually uh, WSDL, they talk about much more. But I mean, ninety-nine percent of the time, people these two you can live with these two. Now, of course, then there's a third dimension, which is that uh, when I send a message, do I can I tolerate if it disappears from the middle? Right? If it is short, if it is synchronous things, which is fine because you know if it failed. Versus if it is asynchronous, it just goes to oblivion and. Uh, it's not correct. I mean, sometimes it's fine, sometimes it's not fine, right? So you need the, sometimes you need the persistence. So this was the next, you can think it as the next layer, very high level. Uh, for some use cases, people need more decoupling, right? So the, there's the decoupling, you can think in three dimensions, right? Uh, the synchronization means when I do a call, do I wait for it to respond? The time means when I do a call, does the other guy has to be up, right? The third one, the space means when I do a call, do I address him by his 
specific address or a logical address. Right? Of course, you can argue the IP address is also a logical address. It's where you draw the line. Right? So then people start to see these kind of use cases. One very common use case was that I have this law work coming, but it suddenly have a spike. It do generate 1,000 TPS. Suddenly, you have 10,000 TPS. Right? Now, my backend system might get you in trouble if you hit that 10,000 for even a small time period. So what you do is you put a message queue in the middle. Right? You collect here. So it will flat out the, these files. Then you send it back. Right? So there are use cases like that. Now, luckily, doing this didn't need a rethought. Right? Basically, what they did was they take to this messaging patterns and incorporated them to the enterprise service class. There were message brokers and I mean they they were developed in parallel, right? Working on each other. And what happened was the ESPs integrated this, adding higher level patterns into their languages supporting this. Okay. Then the recomposition, right? So you have these services, you know how to build them, right? I want to recompose. Now, they, they are recomposed. When you want to recompose, there are two cases. There are short running, there's long run. Now, if it is short running, if you go out and look at the real world, a lot of them, actually, the recomposition had happened at UI. Right? Because, I mean, you don't know, like, it's not very complicated. They just do it on the UI, right? which is not always the great thing to do, but for some use cases, it's fine. Then some do it via code. You could do it through an ESP also. Right? So those are the choices. But there are certain use cases which are very, very long. Take your home law. Do you think the, the computer that runs it would last the time of the loan? 30 year loan? No. <laughs> no way, right? So there are some things which are really long, right? Those has to be handled very differently, and we use workflows. The workflows is a parallel technology that we worked on, right? And then at one point they like the, they build the, they describe how the workflows and web services can work together, and the, it'll come into this SOA. Okay. Fine. Right now, we had this world. We, people were happy for some time with this. About, I think, five years back, they, um, they so uh, what happened was few internet companies start to open their functionality, not just through a website. So far, this functionality were open for humans. It's website. People look at, click, except like right, words. They, uh, this Google, eBay, etc. started this. They said, why don't we let the, the machines call us too? Right? So that means you expose your services out of your security domain to outside. Now, this sounds like a very good idea when you tell about it, but when you go and talk to your security guy and DevOps guy, they say, no, 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 we'll do it. and they give you these 150 things that can go wrong, etc. because it's, it's complicated, because now you need security, you need to worry about the attacks, you need the, all the permission models, etc. So, but this was a pretty common use case, right? So, they came up with something called API Manager. What this does is, it let you give your service, right? And it, this does the heavy lifting of exposing it outside the security of trust domain, right? So it does that by handling security, handling like subscriptions. You can basically, you can tell who can subscribe, how much he used, like put limits, put the throttle in, etc. at that level. Then also give it a registry to find what are the APIs available. Now, by the way, if you if you remember the SOA well, they asked the UDDI registry, right? But it wasn't very widely used, right? You see, it comes out, actually, this is reasonable use. Not 
as much uh, like that was initial talk about the SOIDs, but this reasonable use, right? So the idea of API management is that you put everything together, right, and let you take your internal services and expose them to the outsiders or even your other units. Then you can handle security, you can meet trade, you handle all these details. The API happens, people are happy. Right now, this about 2014, SOA look, sorry, the enterprise architectures look like this. They had a lot of services. Good, right? Uh, the services had more than one client, which is good because if you have SOA architecture and each service has a one client, not good, right? You hadn't done the SOA. Right? And they are recomposed at high levels. Okay? But there was a catch. The catch was that the theoretically they are supposed to be decoupled, loosely coupled. But most of them, most of your services would share databases. Right? And they are generally developed and released as a one big system. Right? So what that means is if, you, if I change my service, actually the, your part would break. Now, your whole system is built by one team, you don't have a problem. You get up, go and talk to the other guy. See, it breaks, let's fix it, fine, right? So if, for small teams, this is not a problem. But for a, a bigger teams, this was a problem. So, now, SOA, in its most purest form, the way it's described, supposed to be loose coupled. However, how it was practiced that the services couldn't evolve independently. So, here comes microservices. Right, so, I mean, again, this is the new downfall lot of fights, just like the rest, right? And this, I mean, my version of the view of this world. The my view is that it is uh, the SOA the vision of SOA didn't describe how you develop the systems, right? And for large systems, it was, the services were not practically loosely coupled. So the microservices give you some things to do that will make you actually loosely coupled. Now, there are a lot of people has written a lot of things about this, but these are the three things, right? <laughs> which I picked, which, uh, which kind of capture these ideas behind microservices. <laughs> One thing is no shared databases. Other is how you handle the versions and backward compatibility. Sorry, something is kind of And how do you handle the dependencies? Okay. So, okay. Now, obviously, if your two services share the same database, and one guy go and change the schema, the other guy will break. <coughs> right? So, so obviously you shouldn't share the databases, which I endorse. Now, fine, great. The, I mean, if you just uh, like, if you are the guy who give the guideline, that, that works great. But if you are the guy who write the code, <laughs> now you need an old menu, right? So what do you do? Right? Because a lot of cases, the reason you share the database is you share the data. <laughs> right? You, you, are, you are a poor programmer who has to now figure out how to do it. You, have, you need some other way to do it. Right? So, so there are several proposals. This one is the most simple one, which is that you merge your two services. Call them one service, and it's a microservice, but it's fine, right? Now, of course, if you take this to the, I mean, if you recursively do it until all the problems are solved, you might end up with one big service, which is not the point, right? So, okay, the option two, you can use asynchronous message, right? So you have a message bus, right? Whenever any update happens, you send it to the other microservices who depend on the updates. Each one do the updates, right? And so you can think each one run parallel state machine, right? Uh, it does not do you strict 
um, consistency, but good enough for most use cases. Uh, so, uh, okay, so this is the easiest, this is a little bit easier, right? Then the, of course, you can use this new transactions. I mean, we all know, again, that's another rat hole, like, <laughs> if you are, especially if you are small, if you are big and if you have bigger job, no problem, right? If you have Oracle, no problem. Or, or you can go for compensation and lesser guarantees, uh, like no SQL, etc. But again, you know that's another at all because uh, again, if you, unless you have people who understand this in a lot of detail, it's not easy. Now these are the choices, right? And uh, for, I mean, if you can get away with this, my recommendation is get away with this, right? Because because that's the least cost, and some use case you can go here, etc. Uh, so again, uh, now if you need the loose coupling, these may be the choices. I'm not saying there are no others, but I mean I have been looking around and these are the choices I have found so far. Okay, great. The next one is that the now if you if you want services to evolve independently, when I do a new real version of the my service, it shouldn't break anybody else, right? Okay. So uh, one option is I can keep the old version running and the new version running. I mean now you have a nightmare of managing state etc. So you don't generally want to do that. So I want to start a new service but it should be backward compatible. Even the older client should be able to open. Okay great. One more step. Now I might suddenly find out oh my one is broken not new one. Now I decide to go back. Oh, what happened if somebody had moved? Now this is forward compatible. Now if you do that, at that point you have to make sure that the guys who might have you to your new, move to new version should be also okay. So that is backward compatible. Now uh, you can't do it forever. This has to be time out. Of course to do this you need idea of a version. If you don't have a version you are completely lost anyway. Right? You need this. Now, doing this, most cases, this is not too hard, but not for all the cases. Most cases, it's, it's a matter of like only adding, when you add new things, add option parameters and don't remove. Sometimes you might ignore. The, you know this option, this option does, I don't need it, but uh, until the time bound is gone, you deprecate it and let it be there and internally handle the details. So, so this you need, again, this is more, but the hope is that if you have a bigger enough team, the savings that you get from real loose coupling and ability to each team to innovate independently would offset the cost. The third case is how do you manage dependencies, rather how you re recompose them. The first one is, of course, I have a lot of microservices. You get microservices called other microservices, right? Fine, now you have the spaghetti. Now, wait a minute. Ten years ago, seeing that the problem that you were trying to solve when you're doing ESP, right? So, I mean, you don't want to go back here. In my opinion, don't go back here because we had walked through this. We know it's pains. Don't go here. Then there are another two choices. But this is the choice that we know. This is the historical choice. The centralized. It can be a workflow, it can be ESP, it can be a code. Client call the workflow, right? Workflow call everybody and figure out the state and everything. The nice thing is that there are no second level dependencies. You have one level dependency only, right? Because other guy don't call another guy. Etc. Right? That simplifies. That removes the spaghetti. Right? This is the older. Oh, this is what we were doing mostly. Now, now then you have this, which is that you can do the same thing at the client. For certain application, for example, if you take the Amazon website or Netflix website, the if you take Amazon website, what happens is you have these different panels, each do independent service calls to back it. There's no one service composition code that is in the client. 
certain UI kind of application, this works. When it works, it's fine, right? Uh, unfortunately, you can't do it for everywhere. Also, there's also another catch. It might have some performance and security concerns. For example, let's say you do a one call to the compression code, which would do 10 calls. Now I'm doing the, all these 10 calls from a slower network, which may be a problem. Also, you have the security concerns because the potentially client can take all this in his machine, right? And finally, you have the choreography, right? The idea is that the, all the services would monitor some way, potentially through an event broker, what's going on at each right place. They do the right thing. You could do it, like for example, Rx, Java, not for JS, etc. Do it for a not distributed case, simple case, one machine. What happened to software architecture layers? To layers? You mean the so three tier? So they have different layer in any architecture. If you remember, if you look at any IoT platform, reference platform, they always have layers. And you are only allowed to call services in lower layers. But that, that, that is true. So, so here I don't see any notion of layers. Would they be of a to that? Or? But this, those layers always translate to different distributed yeah. codes, not, right? Like, mm -hmm. They could, most of the time, those layers don't translate to different distributed codes always, right? Like, like for example, now, the, if you have a 3 tier architecture, mm -hmm. right, that 3 tier may be here, I and mean, there, there's this the client, which actually runs on the client, client side, right? And they actually, I don't show the database here. The database would be here, actually. So this become the application layer. So I think the way I'm, because I'm only thinking about how you compose and put so that. So each of these services could be a client again to lower layers? It, yes. Okay. They could be. Okay. They could be. The, for the lower layers, it is fine. Yeah. And basically, yeah. I'm saying don't like just being like ping pong around. Because what you do in the show is spaghetti. If you would have layers, it would be totally fine. But if it's just. Random, it's not fine. No, I'm saying, yeah. Oh, yeah, going to okay. lower layers, okay. you can't help it, yes. But yeah. at the same layer, pinpointing yeah. is not there. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so now, if you read what's out there, a lot of people say no, yes, right? And they, what they generally recommend is the client driven, right? I mean, you, you read this, and they say, oh, do it on the UI. Of course, for some use case it works, but it doesn't work for use, all the use cases. Uh, what I think might work is that what, what we call micro-integration, which is that earlier you had one ESP which has all the integration in it. Potentially, you take your own integration and run it as a microservice. Right? It, rather, it's, it's a microservice, so you, now people call it microservice gateway. Same thing. Right? So it, I mean, it is a my smaller ESP or smaller virtual engine. Obviously, I mean, it's, it's lightweight, easy to manage, etc. Those are independent of this idea. You can, I mean, you can make it work. So that may be where we are going. Uh, we'll see. Right? Now, okay. Now, the, I'm sure you have heard this term that may you live in interesting times, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you work on visual systems, uh, you know it's not a, a very nice thing to have done it, right? Uh, so, now, if you have, if, now, congratulations, you have built a great distributed system, are you ready to pay the cost? It, you can only justify if you have, have a bigger team, right, and you get a lot of load. Otherwise, please don't make your life, I mean, if you have 10 people who can talk to each other, don't make your life complicated, right? Go back and live in the old world because you didn't have a problem at all, right? So, but if you, if you are hard to do microservices, now you have new problems because now you have this system with 100, 50 to 100 services. You have to, I mean, debugging it is a nightmare to, and there are enough other problems, right? So if you go in this route, please figure out a way to trace it, right? I'll, I'll go a little faster, just a few more power, right? Figure out a way to trace it. That you can do through 
like things like Elasticsearch by tracing logs, or with more uh, complicated analytics. Right? Now, just and to make one more point, these APIs that you add for all the interactions, internally and externally, become a great place to collect data, right? which you can use to give you very detailed analytics on how your business works. Right? So this, this is another kind of a side effect. But the nice thing is that then this data collection, etc., can you don't have to custom write it, it can come as part of the API manager. Okay? Okay, so that is the my views on integration. I'll quickly go through some work we are trying to do to rethink integration. Now, we are in an age of APIs, right? Most apps are built by putting together APIs, right? This may be some IBM Watson API, the um, Amazon API, whatever, right? Different things. We will come. So what we need is a middle layer that make it easy to produce and consume network services, APIs. Now if you look at the integration, it's mostly XML JSON based, right? That's the only way it'll, you can get both sides of grid. It's inherently distributed. That means you need security, etc. Uh, and most of the code is actually what you do is data manipulation and data translation. Because that's you're trying to meet it, right? And uh, often there's a lot of code that's parallel. And <laughs> at least conceptually, you want people have been telling this thing. Didn't really work so far. <laughs> so you are this. Is that uh, make it more accessible to business analysts, etc. Right? At least this has been a goal for a long time. Right? Now, the way you, if you see the way you do integration right now, you do it very second class way. Right? Because you want to, you want to handle the, all the network communication yourself. You have to say create sockets. I mean, I found a DSS. If you don't do the DSS, right? You, are, you have to handle XML JSON because you want to go and back and forth from those to your program language representations, right? And uh, you want to think about security. You want to uh, you want to handle the parallelism, right? And even if you want to do testing, you need a lot of help, you to framework to do this because the the program language level they don't understand any of these details, right? So. Now, of course, you can be put a DSL on top of it. That's what we have done also. That's what all the ASPs has done. Now, the thing is, for simple cases, it's fine. But all the abstraction leads. And for example, when you want to debug, it's very painful, right? And because anything that's between these things, it can become really painful, right? The editors and tools are different quality, right? And when you really need complex logic, right? Because the DSLs generally handle based translation, the network layer only. If you actually want to write some algorithm, something with details, it's very, very painful. You have to either write extension in different language, so on and so forth. The general type systems are weak, no uh, type checkings, etc. And uh, for the use cases that were not directly envisioned for the open performance is not great. So, we are trying to build an alternative, right? So, it has few things. So, the first thing is, it's a first class uh, language. It's, so, we are trying to build a language, right? Which, which is basically, which goes to interpreter, right? Directly into interpreter, not a DSL, right? So, and what we are trying to do is build a language that has textual and graphical parity. What that means is, this is a language where I can type, I can type via code, or I can compose via using sequence diagrams, right? I can do it there. In the middle, I can switch to the other, do a little bit of part there, 
switch back to the other draw lines, switch back to this one, etc. So that you can you get the best of the both worlds. So we'll we'll also it has a it has a native shape type system. Uh, it natively support all the uh, network protocols, etc. Right? Native pattern. So I'll go through a few things quickly. So this this is how the sequence diagram view look like. Now what we had the way we end up with sequence diagram is that whenever we handle a complicated use case, for example, you need to talk to a customer. What happens is he explains we don't understand, we tell stuff he don't understand. We say wait, let's draw sequence diagram. Well, that that's a very good way to capture the details because it's reasonably well understood. You see, get the flow. If you can follow certain parts so that you can see the detail the way you like to see it, right? So, so we show the visual view through a sequence diagram, right? So, very high level, you could create resources which you can recompose back into units, right? And, uh, sorry. And so you could have the statements, and you have something called connectors that represent external systems. I, I'll describe it more in a minute. So now it has the visual and textual parity, right? So you could go back and forth, right? You could edit, right? You could edit, but it's naturally easy to do on on whatever the form, come back, right? Okay. So uh, basically, it has the function which let you compose things there and hide away things, right? And it has annotations. So this the annotation is basically taking over the configuration. Otherwise, you have to handle configuration files, etc. These annotations can be mapped into a configuration file so that you take away that problem because almost any integration needs some configuration, right? Now potentially. This could be used such that the people who got good at code write the detail functions, which is recomposed by business analyst at the visual way, right? And that's the way we see it, right? I mean, yet to be seen what will happen and how it gets adapted. It's, I mean, it's not easy to get a new language adapted, which we had to realize, of course. So, and uh, the language support JSON and XML natively, right? Because basically that means you can say JSON response and you just type in the JSON. Then it'll, it'll not pass it. You don't have to pass it. You just type, you can type JSON XML in line, as a in line. Within here, you can use the variables that are available in the context. You can use within the template, etc. Right? And uh, the the language has a data mapper inbuilt, right? So the, this is how it look at textually. This is how it look like visually, like this, uh, the visual one. So if you want to translate from one data type to other, you could have a visual view, drag and drop and connect things, and basically say, you go back, right? Uh, Etc. because again, that's a very common use case of the integration. Uh, the connectors represent the external systems, external APIs. The idea is that some people would write connectors that give very nice, uh, nice interface for these external APIs. Right? Those connectors are registered. Then they come become a time uh, lifeline. Then you can call, etc. Uh, and we have we are building a tool which can take a swagger and automatically build the connector. Right? Which means any. Which means, for example, if you want to recompose the services built from using Ballerina, you use this tool to create connectors and reuse it with. Okay, so the use cases we we are thinking for Ballerina is that what we call micro integration, right? Now, of, of course, you could so. If you are writing a lot of your logic, you might still want to go and write it in Java, etc. Because if you want to write complicated logic, still, right, that might be your natural case. But if you work with the other services, 
right? If you manipulate data, etc., and oh, if you actually do pure integration, if you do you do more than 80% of this translation things, this might be a good path to go, right? And the, also, the, this language can be a way to do write that simple micro integration units, right? See, small ESP, I said, you have a lightweight ESP, the centralized thing that could do with decomposed things. Uh, and one other nice thing is that it actually has a main method, right? For example, if you want to write a shell script that call to three APIs, get the data and do something, Right? If the, on the shell script, if you want to call to the OS and do things, very easy. But if you want to talk to the internet, it's very hard. There's nothing that lets you do it. So this might potentially, with its main function, can be a scripting language to script the web. For example, if you want to run everything, something that runs daily, that put together things, etc. Right. Potential. So uh, it is open source as usual, Apache license, right? It is available in all these places. And obviously, we are very interested in views, views, etc. And so we have been pushing this very, very uh, actively for some time. So that concludes my presentation. Can take any questions. Thank you. So other questions, comments? And even was the ladies first. Yeah, it's okay. Lady, you are a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the inspiring, great talk. Thank you very much. And um, I have a question about the arena. Did you think about um, distributed execution, or should the execution of the integration scripts be rather centralized at one node machine? And then comparing it with the talk before about the IoT platforms and integration with cloud computing. You could say IoT is just a special case for integration. So, so <laughs> if, if, you, if you take a one Valvina script, mm -hmm. right, it, it runs in a one machine. Yeah. Right? Of course, if you want to have five services, but they actually put on a one service, give some reason, you can do it with the right one script, say, call it like one service, second service, etc., put the logic there, etc. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, if you want the distributed, if you have a distributed solution you want to put together, that you have to do that. You can't draw on the one canvas. So, sorry, when I say that on one code, yeah. you can't write a Balina program that will start services in five different nodes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you can write multiple services in one, right? But if you want, like for example, do this work in this machine, then send a message and do rest of the work. So there's Other no automatic optimization that I could have a big ballerina script and it finds out this integration part, I can push down to the edge. This integration part needs to be done here because it needs yes. information from the So system. that we have, we, at one point we were talking about this and we say, okay, too much complication at yeah, this okay. point. Keep right? it simple, I totally but, get that point. Yeah, yes. but, but I think if you want to do it, potentially you can do it pretty easily with annotations mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you tell where I run, etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically write a layer to do it, but yeah. we haven't done that yet. Okay, nice. I mean, if it, if we, I mean, should, yeah, this, this is open source. Open source. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just don't understand what the design criteria are, where the boundaries are. So yes, and also if you, if you like to do it, yeah, welcome to try to do it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So when I heard about all this all this uh, history, I already lived in, and it's, it's things we tell our students always in our courses on the distributed system. Did I get it right that in the end, uh, despite having different layers, but on one layer, the only thing that really works is something like a, if you can afford it, persistent asynchronous uh, bus that is ruled by a script in the arena or ruled by something else. Uh, and if I can't afford this, you maybe have a transient. That's the only thing but that really works if it gets complex. Um, no, I wouldn't say that's the only thing. So, so no, what happened is there are there are a lot of use cases, especially like short running, short running. I mean, 